Uh, just want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, uh, we're here today to talk about uh, some of the, uh, it helps if I get the right slides. Uh, <laughs> we're here today to talk about um, IoT botnets and a lack of basic security and how they contributed to the IoT botnets. There we go. Okay, so why are we here? What are we what are we looking to do today? Am I missing something here? Okay, so we're going to just briefly dive into a couple of case studies of some recent botnets. I think probably most of the folks here are familiar with uh, the, the, the three that are listed here. Um, and then we'll kind of dive into some of the common security problems uh, that, that, that are common amongst all three of them. They're, they actually were very similar. Uh, the, uh, the issues that, that, that allowed them to propagate and continue to uh, have as much uh, success as they did, uh, they're very similar amongst all three. So we'll dig into some of the, the common security problems uh, and then talk about some of the solution designs. And uh, for those that uh, are in this audience, I'm sure most of the solution designs are pretty obvious. They're pretty straightforward problems. Uh, the scary part is uh, that things will be getting worse over time, not better, and we obviously all have to be diligent uh, moving forward. Now, uh, so, uh, you know, some of the motivation for why we're here, obviously, we always want to kind of review past uh, issues to make sure that uh, we, we don't... Uh, repeat the same mistakes moving forward. Uh, and especially as things move into the connected devices market, it seems uh, some of the embedded folks are repeating a lot of the same uh, mistakes that have been made in the uh, enterprise and, and server world for a long time. So, you know, those of us working in the embedded space are really trying to, to get the word out and, uh, and, and, and avoid these issues. And of course, just the sheer number of uh, devices available in the uh, connected device world makes the, the scope of these kind of issues much worse. So we really need to to keep an eye on things. Um, and, you know, as far as the guys that are here are concerned, you know, we want you to start thinking about designs in your products. Uh, you know, actually, show of hands, who in here actually works on, in the embedded or connected disp device space? Okay, well, more than I thought. So about, about a third or so. So that's, that's pretty good. And obviously, in the Linux world, we're, we're definitely getting uh, moving into the connected device space a lot more, uh, you know, in the last five years or so. So it's definitely picking up. All right, so just a, a little bit about me. My name's Drew Mosley. All my contact info is on there. I'm part of an open source project called Mender.io, uh, which is, uh, it deploys over-the-air updates to uh, connected Linux devices. So that's kind of uh, the bias that I bring to this whole presentation. Uh, these are all uh, uh, things that we've come up with talking with uh, our, our potential users and, you know, those that are going to be using a product like we have to offer. So, uh, you know, if, if there's anything in here that uh, seems biased, uh, this will at least give you an idea idea of why I, uh, why I see the world the way I do. So this is a real-time update that just came in, came across my uh, feeds this morning. Uh, I know at least one person has asked me about it. This is a new botnet that's out there. It's called Reaper. Uh, don't have a whole lot of details on it yet. Uh, it's uh, allegedly relying on more sophisticated techniques uh, and, and relying on actual software vulnerabilities uh, in the installed stacks on some of these connected devices as opposed to the ones that we're going to dig into it here in a bit, which don't aren't quite as sophisticated. So far, they're reporting up to 1 million connected devices. I think the early, uh, I think I saw an early date of sometime in September was when, when they started looking at this. So this thing's spreading pretty rapidly. Uh, fortunately, at this point, it's uh, kind of dormant. It's not actively uh, attacking anything or doing anything. Uh, so as far as we know, somebody's collecting a botnet out there. But uh, for what purpose, I don't think anybody has any idea yet. So uh, there's lots of stuff on the web about that. Uh, if you, you want to chat about that one later, I'd be happy to. I don't know much about it since, it, like I say, it just came up this morning. So the, the kind of the, the, the way we look at things, uh, just to, to discuss these attacks, uh, the first step is always reconnaissance, trying to figure out what devices are out there and, and what services are available and that kind of thing, uh, with the idea being to discover vulnerabilities. Uh, from then, uh, how do you get into the system? What's, what, you know, what's, the, what's the hook? How do, you, how do you get into the system? 
then how do you get back in when you get discovered? And uh, finally, you know, how do you cover yourself up? How do you get out? How do you clean up? That kind of thing. So those are kinds of the the the, the basic roadmap we're gonna gonna use for looking uh, at, at the existing botnets. So Mirai, I think, was the, 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 the first of the botnets that uh, came out. It was uh, back in August of 2016. Uh, the name, I'm not even sure who gave it the name, but it does mean future in Japanese, which has some uh, pretty, b pretty bad connotations if the expectations uh, that this thing's out there. Uh, obviously, it was used for, uh, I think this is the, the most uh, obvious one, was the DynDNS uh, distributed denial of server service attack, which took down a lot of the services. You see the, the, the logos on the, the right half of the screen there. Uh, the DynDNS provider uh, is a very large provider that, that many of the, the large service providers on the internet use, and the, the 24 or 48 hours they were down was uh, pretty, uh, pretty painful for a lot of people, and that was all, all thanks to uh, connected devices is issuing just enormous amounts of traffic. Uh, additionally, Brian Krebs, a uh, well-known security uh, researcher, he, his blog was taken offline with uh, over 600 gigabytes per second of traffic going to his blog. So it's pretty hard for anybody to be able to, to uh, sync that much traffic and still keep things running. So um, the, the scary thing of, uh, of Mirai and the uh, other devices like this are that it can be extended for other uses. D uh, distributed, den excuse me, distributed denial of service attacks are, they're bad enough as it is, but uh, the, the, these botnets are still out there uh, communicating with our command and control servers and could potentially be used for much more nefarious purposes uh, in the future. So uh, <laughs> there's, a, you know, there's a good reason to learn about these things and figure out how to mitigate them moving forward. And surprisingly, the uh, source code is actually available. So if you wanted to go download it and try it on your home system, I wouldn't recommend it. But uh, you know, you certainly could do that. I would recommend spinning up a you know a VM or three if you wanted to do that just to cover yourself. So uh, how, do, how, how does this system work? So initially, it, uh, it connects just to, to a straight up uh, Telnet port. Uh, it's looking for port 23, or I guess some of the devices use port 2323. So uh, the initial connection is just a TCP SYN scan of those two ports uh, looking for uh, potentially vulnerable devices. Uh, a later iter iteration also used uh, what's called CWMP. It's a device management protocol uh, that's used in, in, in the telecom space. Uh, I don't myself know anything about it, but uh, that was one of the, the, the later additions to this, uh, to this botnet. And basically, once they find a, uh, an open telnet port, there's a, a set of 62 default usernames and passwords, and they attempt to log in. And these are things like admin, admin, you know, the, those things that you can look up when you get a new device and you get home and you say, how the heck do I access this? So you Google it. Uh, and it's amazing how many devices on the, with, with internet facing devices to the wider internet are s still sitting there with an unencrypted telnet connection with default usernames and passwords. And so, once they're able to, uh, once they identify a vulnerable device that they're able to log into, uh, the, that device information comes back to the reports uh, to the report server, and, the, and it's basically just a database of all these vulnerable devices that are out there on the network. And at that point, that's effectively the botnet. Uh, so every, you know, the, that's just the initial scan, connect, and uh, uh, enumerate the devices that are available. And then we move into uh, w what happens next. So once, once the devices are uh, identified, then the actual Mirai uh, binaries get installed onto the device. Uh, and then once they're installed and running, uh, they, they, do, they make some attempts to obfuscate themselves. They, they rename themselves as Telnet D. Uh, they randomize the process name. They delete their uh, executable, which the, the, the nice thing about that is that means Mirai does not survive a reboot, but ultimately, that doesn't matter in these cases. Because uh, the simple fact is, the, the device reboots, it's still on the internet. How long do you think it takes before it's going to get infected again? Right? We've, uh, you know, we've all heard the, the horror stories of uh, people putting like, you know, unprotected Windows, uh, Windows uh, 2000 systems on the network. And what's the average time? 30 seconds or something till it gets attacked by something. So you know, it's nice that these things don't survive reboots, but uh, that's only a uh, minor mitigation. Um, and then addition, in, in addition to obfuscating themselves, then the, the, the uh, Mirai binary uh, attempts to remove other services that uh, could potentially allow you to get in and, and clean up. So if it's got SSH or Telnet, it tries to remove your access to that. And it even does some, some cleanups of, uh, of other malware, presumably 
so that there's uh, less chance of you know, adverse interactions with other things on the device that it's unaware of. Um, and then finally, it just sits there kind of quietly waiting for the command and control server. Uh, and while it has nothing else to do, it's uh, out scanning for more victim devices that might be close by that it could uh, pass the infection off to. So the amount of code needed to actually for these devices to scan is pretty low because all they're doing is getting the IP address and information and passing it back to the server. So there's plenty of bandwidth for these devices while they're waiting for the command and control server to come in uh, to, to be able to spread that network even further. So. So in summary on this, you know, it's a, there's at least 30 vendors that are known uh, about of these devices that are out there. Uh, they're fairly, fairly commonly used devices. Uh, they're all embedded Linux in this case. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously the, the, the biggest issue is default credentials that anybody can find. Uh, and it's, it's pretty astounding the number of infections uh, that, uh, that, that can happen uh, just because it's a, as simple a problem as it was. Th this slide says 600,000 plus. I saw a number this morning said I think over 2.5 million devices are now on the, on the wider internet and in, infected with this. So, uh, and, and cleaning it up is tough because, you know, how many people are going to go into that closet and find that uh, webcam that's been sitting there for, you know, five years and, and, and get it updated? So the next one we want to talk about, uh, Hajime, uh, is very similar in scope uh, or in the way, in the way it works. Um, it, it was discovered right around the same time, and it was actually named by the researchers. Uh, and interestingly, uh, they, 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 they uh, published a report and uh, mentioned some bugs that were part that they discovered in their analysis, and in the next release of the Hajime worm, those bugs were fixed. So the unknown author is actually keeping an eye on things and you know improving it. Um, now you know the name was adopted by the authors; it wasn't actually from the authors. So uh, <laughs> whoever is uh, whoever is in control of this definitely knows what's going on. Now the first thing that happens when you get uh, when when you get this infection is you know on on your serial console or whatever kind of text console uh, you get a, a message from the uh, from from the uh, Hajime worm that seems to indicate this is a white hat hacker trying to do good stuff but again it uses the same techniques as as uh, Mirai so ultimately it could be hijacked for for bad things. Um, so far, it hasn't been used for any attacks. The, it's been used really just to go in and uh, clean up the devices if it finds uh, telnet ports that are open, and you know, presumably it disables those and that kind of thing. So, the idea being, uh, w we assume it's a white worm, you know, with good intentions, but you know, nobody really knows. Uh, so, you know, the fact that this has to be done to target Mirai, that's a problem. So, device manufacturers really need to step up. So s similar to Mirai, uh, we use just a standard uh, IP uh, SYN check to port 23. Uh, we've got 64 usernames and passwords. So this, this one actually has two more than the, than the Mirai. So this one's actually more functional uh, than Mirai. So it's a good thing the author doesn't seem to be wanting to do bad things. Um, and then there's a, a file transfer binary. In this case, it's only 484 bytes uh, written in raw assembly. That's just uh, that, that, that's tran that, that's written as part of the uh, the um, connection to the device initially. And then that binary goes out and, and downloads the actual Hajime binary at that point. And at that point, the device is infected, and it just sits there uh, and, and waits for commands. Now, it's a little bit more sophisticated in the way the devices uh, uh, talk to each other. In the case of Hajime, they use a d distributed hash tree uh, with an overlay network on the, the, the wider internet. So all the devices actually know about each other and can c communicate directly if they need to. Um, it, it, uh, it, it then installs the Hajime scanner and, and continues propagation onto uh, any other devices that may be nearby. Uh, and again, it, it does the similar kinds of things. It will, uh, it, it renames itself to Telnet D to make it a little uh, harder to figure out if it's actually there or not. Uh, and again, it doesn't survive reboots, but it's the same issue that we had with the Mirai botnet. Uh, you reboot and you get reinfected pretty quickly. Uh, and, and in this case, the reason uh, that, that we expect that its, uh, its intents are uh, positive is that it's actually closing the, the, the ports you see here, which are fairly commonly used for access uh, for nefarious purposes. So, so far, this one appears to be uh, uh, doing good, good things for, uh, for the wider internet, but it's unclear what the actual motivations are. Yes? 
probably just because of the time the research was actually done. Uh, I suspect if somebody were to do a, an analysis and comparison now of the number of uh, vulnerable machines of both of these, I can't imagine they would be all that different because they're, you know, in, unless, you know, they're kind of fighting it out uh, on the internet. So that's the other interesting thing, right? If a GMA gets in there first, Mirai theoretically cannot connect. So it, it definitely would be interesting to see how they, they, they compete over time, but I don't think anybody's actually done that. So in summary, uh, you see the details here. ARM 5, ARM 7, Intel x86-64, and MIPS. So you know, that covers a, a very wide range of, uh, wide range of the uh, devices that are out there. Um, and again, we're exploiting the default uh, credentials, uh, which is uh, you know, starting to be a common theme. Uh, basically, it targets the same devices as Mirai. So uh, as we, I just mentioned, you know, the, this does appear uh, specifically designed to target Mirai. Uh, which one's winning? I don't think, uh, I've not seen any uh, indication that, that, that would tell us uh, whether one or the other is, is winning the war. And, and the last one we want to talk about is called BrickerBot. Uh, this one's a, a, a bit more nefarious, but also it appears to be an attempt to uh, mitigate uh, the, the, the negative impacts of the, the botnets. So uh, the author claimed 2 million total infections. Based on some of the numbers I've seen for some of the other botnets, that doesn't seem unrealistic. Um, but once it connects to the device, it, it, and if you, I don't know if you can read the, the, the commands in this window here, but uh, for those that know what those commands do, those are uh, who, the things you don't want to do to your uh, Linux systems. The idea is it's trying to wipe the storage and eff effectively make the device completely unusable. Uh, people have termed the, they've coined the term permanent denial of service attack on, on these. And, and the, the intent it seems to be uh, once these devices get infected with the BrickerBot, the intent is to, to make the devices worthless. Why, you know, erase the flash, turn off all network capability, and, 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 and literally turn it into a brick. I guess not literally, but <laughs> you, you get the idea. And so again, we're going back to TCP port 23, brute forcing the Telnet login attempts, and then, as I mentioned, we, we attempt to completely brick the device. Of course, the interesting thing with BrickerBot, since it's destroying the device, it doesn't then continue uh, the infection forward. So once the device is, is taken offline and, and, and no longer useful for anything, it's, it's out of the network. Uh, so there, are, there is a static set of attacking devices. And it turns out they all appear to be uh, well, I've got the details on a, a later slide, but the attacking devices appear to all be embedded Linux devices running some variant of Telnet and uh, the Dropper SSH protocol. So it's, they're, they're fairly low-powered devices that are doing this. Uh, presumably, they're just the, the, the first set of devices that, that were contacted and uh, taken over by this bot. So. And, and you see the details here from the the. the, the, the a uh, person who claims to have uh, written this tool uh, obviously uh, is uh, not particularly thrilled with the uh, industry's attempts uh, to, to resolve this uh, and figured that this was uh, uh, the nuclear option, so, uh, so to speak, to uh, uh, address some of these uh, challenges that uh, don't appear to be doing uh, much for, uh, or sorry, don't appear to be taking, uh, being fixed by industry itself. So as I mentioned, drop rate with Telnet. You see the 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 the, uh, the map on the on the screen there. That's where the uh, known devices are. Uh, so effectively, with you know some tens of devices, uh, this uh, botnet has effectively captured, at least reportedly, uh, up to two million devices. So with, with with a very small number of devices in 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 the fleet, he was able to capture. Uh, quite a bit. And again, this is targeting the same devices as the previous two. So, you know, at this point, all three of these botnets are competing for the same space. Uh, and it's, it's going to be interesting over the next, uh, I don't know, three to six months to, to see how things play out. And as, as I mentioned, you know, uh, the industry doesn't appear to be uh, fixing it. You know, we've all, we've all had a, uh, a, a cheap consumer electronic device that uh, the, the, the firmware update mechanism was uh, such a pain in the neck that it uh, just never got done. And, you know, and, th and that's for those of us that are spending all our time doing technology. Can you, you, you can imagine how difficult it is for those where technology is supposed to just kind of mesh into the background. So uh, you, know, you can't rely on the end users. Uh, 
the uh, buyers do ultimately need to demand better security, but uh, most of your average consumers aren't aware enough uh, to actually demand that. So, you know, there is uh, at least one bill uh, in Congress in the United States that's uh, attempting to require that at least for U.S. government purchases, there, there's more security involved. I don't know all the details, uh, but uh, obviously getting uh, a heavyweight like the U.S. government to, to start pushing for this, maybe we stand a chance of getting some, uh, getting some uh, improvement uh, overall down the road. And of course, the alternative is uh, more bot, more uh, vigilante botnets like the the, the Bricker bot, uh, where people take it on their own to to get in there and try to uh, figure things out. So, uh, and and just uh, kind of a, a little bit broader uh, view of things, you know, ultimately your goal is to make it hard or make it hard for somebody to attack your device or make the value of a successful attack low right if i have a uh, if i have say a a fast pass for a toll system the value of that attack is pretty low yeah you can you know charge me a you know a couple euros at a time off my credit card but you're not going to be you're not going to be do issuing a distributed denial of service attack so the the value of that attack is 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 fairly low whereas you know with uh, connected devices uh, obviously, with, with the devices we've been talking about here, the value is potentially high depending on what your goals are. If your goal is uh, denial of service, uh, it's clear what the value is. And uh, you know, the, with those devices out there, uh, it, it could just get worse. Uh, you know, generic solutions uh, for these kind of things are just basic good security practices, right? I mean, uh, default username and password uh, is a bad idea. Uh, we don't want that. Close unused ports, uh, make sure your firewalls are sound, uh, you know, un remove any software you don't need, right? The most secure software is that which isn't even installed, so don't, don't provide unnecessary features. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, d disable the default credentials. I, I'll say that again, because that, that, that has been the result of most of the, the issues that we're seeing here. So we'll come back to this slide here and just kind of kind of briefly talk about some of the mitigation uh, effects. So you know, in reconnaissance, uh, obviously, the, if you can slow the reconnaissance down, uh, you slow the, the, the spread of these things. And Telnet uh, is generally uh, fairly, easy to, fairly easy to get to. Uh, it's pretty simple. Dis uh, display, uh, close all the ports. Don't leave anything open that you don't need. Uh, proper network segmentation. Uh, you know, if, you're behind a, behind, if your devices are behind firewalls, they're not available to be uh, hacked from the outside. So just keep, keep those things in mind. Uh, to, to minimize the, the, the intrusion potential, obviously, uh, uh, providing uh, random passwords and not default credentials for everybody, uh, and then uh, some kind of security update mechanism. Uh, obviously, we all, we've all seen CVEs and, and lots of uh, critical, uh, uh, criti critical vulnerability ex that, that, that needed to be fixed. And then in terms of uh, what they can do once they get in, inserting backdoors and that kind of thing, you know, don't provide privileges where they don't need to be. Uh, again, all standard security things. I don't think there's anything new here. The sad thing is that um, over time, it's going to get harder. Our jobs will get harder. Uh, but we shouldn't uh, make it too easy on, on, on the attackers now. And, and one, one kind of self-serving thing, obviously, uh, the ability to update things over the air is, is critical in addressing these, uh, these vulnerabilities moving forward. Uh, so, uh, you know, if, if you don't have an update mechanism uh, in your designs, you should, should get it. Just a show of hands, for those that do the, the uh, connected embedded devices, what, do you get, how many of you have an update mechanism built in? And is it okay? And those that do, is it uh, home built or is it uh, is it a, uh, a third party uh, pro project? What's that? Which ones do you want to show? Uh, the, who has a uh, home built? Okay, so that's the majority. And who uses a, a, a third party project? Okay, so one in one in the entire room. So there's there, there's a lot, and w w I've got to talk later on uh, some updater technology. So I'd definitely be interested for those that do a home built. I'd definitely be interested in uh, uh, discussing that a bit further. So with that, I do have some uh, backup slides, but uh, I wanted to give a, a little bit of time uh, for questions, and five minutes for questions, ten minutes for questions. So we got we got we got more time uh, than I expected. So. Uh, we've got uh, a microphone coming around if anybody's got any questions. All right, in the back.
So you recommend having some sort of OTA update mechanism. How do you protect that against attack? Well, it has to be well designed. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, again, it comes back to standard security practices. That you've got to use uh, TLS connections. Uh, ideally, your images will be cryptographically signed to ensure that you're installing the right things. Uh, I don't think there's any real unknown uh, problems that, that can't be solved by standard mechanisms. It's just a, a matter of being diligent and, and using the known good practices. How, how does your company handle it? Uh, exactly that way. We use TLS for, for all the communications. The, the uh, certificates are baked into the images at build time so that you know that you're talking to the right server. And then in addition to that, we have cryptographic uh, signatures on, on all the images so that once the, the client downloads the image, there's an additional verification step just to make sure there wasn't some kind of man in the middle attack or something. And do you handle certificate rotation as well? Uh, it's something we're working on. I don't know that we have a, uh, in, uh, I don't know all the details on it, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely come up. And if you want to ping me afterwards, I can, uh, I can get in touch sure. with you and get you a more definitive answer. Okay, thanks. All right, anybody else? The, the botnets you showed used uh, very like trivial attack methods, which is you know like a default username and passwords. Is is there a reason that the all the examples you showed have those, or have you just not seen many more sophisticated attack methods? Well, those three are are you know practically all using the exact same attack method, and and so they're kind of they're kind of fighting each other. The the, the other one that I mentioned, the Reaper, is 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 relying more on vulnerabilities in the the installed uh, software and. That, that's as much as I got from the article that came out uh, this morning. So I fully expect that uh, over time these attacks will become more sophisticated, but this is low-hanging fruit. So, you know, it's not surprising that, <laughs> that, that, that somebody took advantage of it this quickly. Have you seen any two-step attacks? I mean, uh, attacks that take over a host computer? and then use that computer to attack the um, IoT devices that are connected to the local network that usually wouldn't be available from the outside because of a router or, or a firewall. I can't say that I have, but uh, it certainly sounds like something that could, could, could happen in the future. Uh, and obviously, that would be a, a, a means to kind of bypass the whole network segmentation firewalling. Uh, you know, because a lot of the, the, the best practice recommendations are don't put any of your IoT devices uh, on your home network, right? Put them all on a separate network. So, you know, there are obviously ways to work around that. Um, basically, assume any IoT device you get is, is untrustworthy. Um, I haven't seen anything like you suggest in, in any, in any uh, large numbers, but uh, it's certainly something that would be, uh, that, that we need to be on the lookout for. All right, anybody else? Very good, thank you so much.